be that help us to uh, picture in our minds uh, the steadfast love of the Lord. Did you hear all the metaphors from creation? And uh, that, that is a quality written song because it draws on our hearts and it makes our minds engage. If we sing that his love, we see his love like a rainbow or like the, the mist across the water or like the dew across the meadow. And I was thinking that, you know, we have evidence of that kind of poetry and that kind of song in the psalm book, the Psalms of the Old Testament. God is our refuge. That's a metaphor. God is our high tower. That's a metaphor. And so what's really great is when you're looking for quality music, you want to look for music that actually kind of duplicates a little bit of what we see in the Hebrew songbook of the Old Testament. And uh, that's why metaphors are so powerful in our hymns and in our singing, uh, because we see that also in the songs of the Old Testament. And if we started to talk about all of the different metaphors of the books, book of Psalms, we, we could probably all give examples of that. And so we don't want shallow, trite lyrics. We want lyrics that properly represent God. And, and uh, metaphors are a wonderful, wonderful way of, of showing the depth of, of the relationship that we have with our God. Well, if you are not here in Sunday school, then we're kind of jumping into the middle of, of something that you have not heard yet. But we talked a lot about the idea of worship being our response mentally, emotionally, and physically to the truth of our God. And so we've kind of set the stage for this final uh, session today, this final message today on the subject of music. Remember, we're talking about worship, music, and the local church. And I think they all go together pretty well. And uh, we, I think even today has been a representation of how important music can be and should be in our local churches. So I want to dive right in. But before we do that, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 40, because Psalm 40 is a wonderful passage of Scripture that helps us to see that our music as believers should be radically distinct, should be new. And maybe you've seen this psalm before. There are many references to this. And the reason I'm sharing this passage is because I don't have time to give you all of, all of the passages uh, that uh, bring to us uh, things about our music. But there are hundreds of those verses in the Bible. We are going to be talking specifically about what the Bible says about music. But this is just to jump us into this subject. Look what it says in Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. What, what, um, what situation or what experience is he describing? Your salvation, your conversion. And there's some wonderful things that happen. Your feet are, are set on a solid rock. He's established your ways. He uh, rescued out of, out of a horrible pit. Once again, we see a lot of metaphors there, don't we? That's pretty cool. But notice verse 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Now, I've heard people say that this is just a general reference to the song of your life. But I would submit that uh, we, we have... Lots of verses in the psalm book, the song book of the Old Testament, that tell us we're supposed to have a new song. I personally believe that this is not just a general reference to the song of our life, but I believe it is saying that Christians should have a different way of praising God. They should have a different song, literally a different kind of music. The word new is a new in quality and in kind. And so as we talk about the subject of music, it is really important that we understand that the Bible has hundreds of references to the subject of music. And we're tagging on what we talked about earlier this morning, how we need to be, we need to have knowledge to bring clarity to our worship. We need to focus on the person, not the place. Remember these principles we looked at and we're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And, and to jump us into this subject, I've given a couple quotes here. I hope you can see these uh, as I read them. But James Montgomery Boyce said this, If the chief end of the service elements, including music, uh, it would be to turn the attention of the worshiper away from himself. That's what we saw in John chapter 4. It's really, uh, it's really about Jesus Christ. It's about God, not about us. 
if that is the intention of the worship service and even of the actual service itself, I like the way he says that, then the first question we need to ask is whether this is what our music is doing. Is that what our music is doing in the church? Turning our attention away from us, away from the service itself, and directing our attention uh, appropriately to God. Kent Hughes said this about music. He said, The unspoken but increasingly common assumption of today's Christendom is that worship is primarily for us. It is to meet our needs. How many of you have ever heard that before, right? And then we have churches that kind of survey the community to find out what people want and they give them what they want instead of giving them what God wants for their life. Sometimes, sometimes we need what we don't even know we need. And so he says such worship services like that are entertainment focused and the worshipers are uncommitted spectators who are silently grading the performance. And this is exactly what I was referring to in the first session already this morning. So music is of utmost importance because it is commanded by God. It's actually one of the most prolific commands in the scripture that we are to sing. You know what that means? If you don't sing in church, you're not obeying God. <laughs> you need to sing. Everybody should be singing. It is commanded of God for us to sing. So we need to, we need to discuss this matter of music. So what I've done uh, through the years in really developing my own personal philosophy of music is I've studied literally every text in the New Testament and the, the Old and the New Testament throughout the Bible that touches on the area of music. And I've tried to categorize those verses in several different key points. And, and you'll see that as we go throughout that, this this morning. But as we continue, David Bloom said this. He said, nothing is more singular about this generation than it's addiction to music. This is in the book called The Closing of the American Mind. He said, today a very large portion of young people between the ages of 10 and 20 live for music. He said, I suspect that the rock addiction, particularly in the absence of strong counter-attractions, has an effect similar to drugs. This is a secular author writing and being honest about the pull and the power and really the addiction that people can have to their music. So we have a kind of modern day writer talking about the significance of music, but we also have a not so modern day writer, right? Aristotle. And it's interesting, I actually have a book that I've recently started reading, I'm about halfway through, that is called A New Song from the Old World. And it's interesting that the author is a, a writer today who is going back and surveying all of the church fathers and all of the church fathers that were living during the time of these philosophers like Aristotle, and he is categorizing what they said about the subject of music. And you know what I've learned? I've learned that just because we've gone centuries past, uh, we're, we're still struggling with the same things they were struggling with. It just is a, a kind of different methods and maybe a different culture, but they were, they were still arguing about and discussing uh, the role of music in the church. But Aristotle said this, he said, music directly represents the passions or states of the soul, gentleness, anger, courage, and temperance. If one listens to the wrong kind of music, he will become the wrong kind of person. That's interesting that he wrote this before rock pop music. If you listen to the right kind of music, conversely, he says, if he listens to the right kind of music, he will tend to become the right kind of person. And this helps us to see that really uh, almost, almost everyone that is thinking through the subject of music understands that music does determine what's, what's happening and going on in somebody's life. And scripturally we see that, that your music represents your view of God and your music represents the Holy Spirit or the flesh control of your life. And so music is absolutely crucial. And so as I talk about this today, I want to talk first of all about the plan. And this is where we get into some scriptural references. And if you're taking notes, just jot down these references and go, uh, go through uh, the Bible on your own and develop your own philosophy of music. Philosophy is why we do what we do. It is a system of beliefs that guide our actions. It is a, 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 and it is, needs to be based primarily on the Word of God. And what I find is that there are a lot of people arguing about music that don't even know one verse. And if, you, if you're going to argue about music, you might want to know what the Bible says. The Bible is the most important tool to help us in any area. And the Bible's not going to say, thou shalt not listen to rap. 
But the Bible will say, do not be conformed to the world. And the Bible will say, he had put a new song in my heart. And we got to determine, does, does rap fit into being conformed to the world? Or is this rap... Uh, or or some other uh, style of the culture? Does it represent a new song? And so we take principles of the Bible and we apply it to our philosophy. And so this is what I've tried to do in my own personal life. And as I now get the privilege of of training and teaching and representing this this kind of music philosophy. And here's what I want to say about the plan of music. This is awesome. Music was God's idea. You know, it's really great to know that God is a creative God and and God made creative people and that God is the the author of the very music and the very singing that he commands us to do. He he is the author of that. And I'm so thankful that he created music for his own glory. How do we see this in the Bible? Well, Ezekiel 28 verse 13 is a very, very important text that helps us to see that God created an angel. This is describing Lucifer. And uh, God created an archangel named Lucifer who would be the worship leader of heaven. Most Bible scholars believe uh, that Lucifer was probably created to guide the worship in heaven, which is why God made him, literally made him a musical being. Look what the verse says. Thou hast been in Eden, describing Lucifer. The garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire is a beautiful image, a beautiful person. The emerald and the carbuncle and gold. And then notice it says the workmanship of thy tabrets, a musical instrument, and of thy pipes, another musical instrument, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. I have actually read commentators who believe this is uh, poss- possibly describing Lucifer who actually, when he would speak, would actually speak in music because he, he actually literally had music created inside of him. I don't know if that's necessarily the case or not, but what we know from this text is that Lucifer was a musical being. Does it not surprise us? Shouldn't it be surprising to us that music is one of the most uh, divisive subjects in the church today and the devil knows how to deceive Christians and the devil knows how to turn people away from true worship because the devil knows music and God created Lucifer and of course we know he said I will exalt myself against the most high I will be like God and God had to cast him out of heaven with all the other angels and demons that followed him and so we know what the scripture is teaching here is that Lucifer God created Lucifer as a musical being But not only did he create Lucifer that way, but the Bible tells us that all of his creation in some sense is musical and sings back to the Lord. We know this. The scripture teaches that all creation was made for what purpose? To give God glory, to to worship. This is the primary and the ultimate purpose of God is that we would be worshipers of him, that we would be responding, recognize that word, responding to him, not in ritual, but in a heartfelt response to him. So he made all creation to sing. So many references about this. First Chronicles 16, verse 33. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord. Now, I know that the trees have no intellect and the trees have no ability to sing like we sing, but they do make sounds and they do make musical sounds. I think is the idea here. And they're, they're giving praise in, in those sounds to the Lord. Uh, the morning stars sing together. These are references that help us to see that God created his world to be musical. Uh, All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. And maybe you can uh, think of other hymns that represent the creation music. There is creation music that gives God praise. Psalm 65 verse 13, the pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout out for joy. They are also singing. And again, I know it's different than the intentional intellectual singing that we do, but the point is God is musical. God designed his creation to be musical. Psalm 66, verse four, all the earth shall worship and shall sing unto thee and they shall sing unto thy name. Psalm 104, verse 12, by them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing 
among the branches. And of course, we've all heard the birds sing, right? And it is really musical. And I, I'm sure there have been studies. Um, some of you music, musicians out there, you look it up. I'm sure there have been studies to actually study the, the theory and the progression and, and the sounds that are coming out of even the birds. I'm sure they're out there. And that might be a wonderful thing to kind of investigate a little bit. But all the birds are singing praise to the Lord. So God made Lucifer an angel to sing. God made all creation to sing. And I'm just trying to show you that music was, was God's idea. It was not created by man. It was created by God. And so this, this brings great weight to the reality that we need to make good decisions about this music. Because God knows music. Now watch this. Not only that, but God sings. God sings. And uh, there's just a couple references that tell us this. Job 35 verse 10. But none saith, where is God, my maker? Notice this, who giveth songs. He giveth songs in the night. Could it be that God is actually a composer? <laughs> Zephaniah 3 verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. Notice this. He will joy over thee with singing. Now, I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say for sure what God's voice sounds like, but I sure hope I can hear it when I get to heaven. And uh, he, he, if he's singing over us in this way, then he surely cares about what the sounds sound like. Okay? This, this really helps us to see that it, it's not a neutral area. Because nothing that God has created to bring him glory can, ex can be expressly neutral. All right? It either glorifies him or it doesn't. All right? And we're talking about the sounds. The sounds themselves. So it's really important that we recognize that music was God's idea. All right? So this is the plan that God had in music. And I'm really glad because I'm a musician. And any of you that are involved in music should just praise God that, he, that uh, he's the designer of it. And he's the one that ordered it. And uh, he's the one that's composing and singing, and, and he made all creation to sing praise to him. It gives us great reason to be involved in music. All right, number two, let's notice this. The priority, the priority of music. All right? If music was God's idea, then he thinks it's pretty important. All right? This is, this is the fact that everyone that God has made should be involved in music. Now, maybe you don't enjoy music or maybe you do. Maybe you are, you, you're one of those people that can't even remember the last time you listened to a song on your own. Now, I know you're kind of forced to do that when you, when you hear the Herbsters, okay? But you're, you're forced to do that when you come to church. But maybe you don't really enjoy listening to a lot of music, and, but maybe some of you are like listening to music every day. And we do hear music out and about in the culture around us as well. But... All of us are to be involved in this idea of music that is worshipful to the Lord. Now, how do we see this in the scripture? Remember, this is just a simple, systematic study of a lot of verses in the Bible. Well, first of all, we see this by talking about this simple principle, that God has shown us in the Bible that he has gifted certain people musically. How many of you know somebody that is gifted musically? All right, you're, you, when you sit back and you're like, how, did, how do they do that? That's amazing. Um, I heard a couple people talking about our pianist, Mike's wife, Amy. She's, she's one of the people that I think about when I think about this. God has gifted certain people musically. I mean, were any of you watching? She's not using music over there. And we just say, this is the song we're going to sing. And we haven't sung it in several you know, months or even years. And she's like, oh, no problem. And she, she has to memorize with 10 fingers. All we got to do is memorize the lyrics in one part. And uh, she is absolutely gifted of God in the area of music. Now, uh, I don't know if you understand much of how much you understand about music. But when you talk about music, you talk about it in, in theory and then in performance. All right. So you have you have the theory behind the music and then you have the performance. And the reason why the performance goes so well is because the theory, the structure is in is in the theory behind it. So somebody that is actually really gifted in music actually understands all of the theory behind the music. To give you an illustration, Amy's heard me say this before. One time we were driving in the car and, and, and Mike, Mike and Amy were in there and, and Amy and I were in there. We were playing a CD that had no lyrics. It was just orchestration music. And while the CD was being played, she was naming the chords that were being played as she heard them. 
She didn't see the music. She was naming it by ear. Watch this. She was not only naming the chords, she was naming the inversions of the chords. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just don't worry. Just go back to sleep, okay? Uh, an, an inversion of the chord is which, which uh, note is, is at the bottom of the chord, all right? So if the, the tonic is the root of the chord, you're in first inversion. If the third is the root of the chord, you're in second inversion. If, you're, if the fifth is the root of the chord, then you're in fifth inversion. I hope I said all that right. She would probably correct me on, on, on some of that. But there's something like that, okay? Inversions. I've, I've had a little bit of music theory. She's had a whole lot of music theory. But honestly, she's thinking theory when she's playing. That's just the way she's built. And what I'm saying is that God has gifted certain people that way to show us that it should be a priority in our lives. It should be a priority in the church. And some of you know people like that as well. Do you know there were gifted people in the Bible? Genesis 4 verse 21 says, and his brother's name was Jubal. Who was Jubal? Well, he was the father of all as such as Handel, the harp, and the organ. Not only was he probably building the instruments, but he was an expert in these instruments. And you know, most of the time, if you're someone building the instrument, you're someone that also plays the instrument. And I, I do believe that he was, he was gifted musically to handle and play the harp and the organ. How about 1 Chronicles 9, verse 33? The Bible tells us that in the Old Testament, there were professional musicians. These are the singers, chief of the fathers of the Levites, who remaining in the chambers were free, for they were employed in that work day and night. And there were singers and there were players that were employed. They were, they were sought out people to help in the, in the, in the uh, worship of Israel in the Old Testament. And I do believe this is why it's, it's important to utilize people that are gifted in music in the local church. There, are, there is this big push today for only congregational music. I love congregational music and I love the emphasis on congregational music. But I think it's a shame that there's a lot of churches that have gifted musicians that are not actually utilizing them to help draw the people of God to worship the Lord in a most excellent way. I do believe that we should utilize people who are gifted in music and we should allow them to worship God appropriately through the gifts that God has given to them. All right, 1 Chronicles 25, verse 7. So the number of them, these are the, the employed musicians with, with their brethren that were instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning. That's an interesting Hebrew word. That's the, the Hebrew word for wisdom, the word cunning. In other words, skillful. Even all that were skillful was 200, four score, and eight. A whole bunch of people that were very, very skilled at using their music in the worship of the church. And this is incredible for us to see because uh, God has placed a special priority, so much so that he's made certain people to have those gifts. Now, sometimes, sometimes somebody's gifted intellectually, sometimes someone's gifted athletically, sometimes someone's gifted musically. But what we see in the scripture is that music was implanted in certain people so that they could be utilized for the glory of God. So God created music and God wants music to be a special part of our lives because God has gifted people musically. But here's the second way we see the priority of music. And that is that the Bible teaches us that God wants music to be an important part of our worship in the church. Okay, and in the Old Testament worship, we see this, 1 Chronicles 6, verse 31. And these are they whom David set over the service of the song in the house of the Lord after the ark had rest, and they ministered before the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the congregation of the Lord with singing. And so Old Testament worship and New Testament worship, we see that music is supposed to be a part of the church. Hebrews 2 verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I praise, uh, uh, sing praise unto thee. So what we, are, what we did already today is, is the commanded of God, we're to be uh, singing in in praising the Lord in our local congregations. And God has commanded that, which means it's pretty important. Now, I do believe that the most important part of our worship to the Lord is responding to the word. So preaching should be primary. Okay, but preaching is another, uh, another element of our worship. I don't even know if it's proper necessarily to categorize the priority levels. I think all of this is important. 
But of course you want a church that is preaching. But you know what? I think there are people that are, that are satisfied to go to a church that has really good preaching and then, the, they're, then they're jamming out in their music. And, and I, don't, I think it's kind of contradictory. When you, when you say that you want to have that kind of worship with preaching, but then you, but that you don't, that you allow your family to be exposed to that kind of worship. Because uh, the preaching of the word kind of transforms our thinking, but the music transforms our feelings, if I can say it that way, our affections. Both are important. Remember I said this earlier, you can worship the right God with the, in the wrong way. And you can, you can think right about God at the same time you're feeling wrong about him. So it's our thinking, it's our feeling, and our living that needs to be properly ordered in balance so that we are worshiping the Lord appropriately. And, and, and really, the music in the church is so important that we are developing the affections and the emotions of people in the right way with the right style of music. Uh, like I said earlier, there's so much more that I'd like to say, and I'm trying to just give you kind of a, a summary overview, okay? There's a lot more that could be said, but we need to keep moving on. This is incredible. God will use music in heaven. Amen. So God made certain people musical. God wants music to be a part of our local church congregational worship. And guess what? If you, if you don't like to sing here, you may as well start learning because you're going to sing in heaven. Amen. And some of you are like, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Well, when you get to heaven, you'll have your glorified voice, okay? So uh, the, I often think that we'll sing the hallelujah chorus, but it's probably going to be a whole lot better than that. We're going to sing with the angels. We're going to sing with God. And notice what the Bible says about this. Revelation 14, verses 1 through 3. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers, harping with their harps, musical instruments. And they, they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So here's, here's this huge chorus of people that are going to be singing in heaven. Uh, and so there are many references about that when we sing, worthy is the lamb that was slain. It's going to be a wonderful privilege to give our worship to the Lord in that perfect place with perfect voices with our perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. So we have the plan of music. We have the priority of music. And I know we're moving through a lot of references and I'm not even giving you all of them. Number three, let's talk about the power of music. Again, just to reiterate, what I did is I went through all the verses in the Bible and I categorized them in different, these different categories. And so what, what we notice is that music has great power. Music impacts people. Music, music binds people. Music changes people. Now, when I speak of music, I want everybody to be clear that I'm not just talking about music with lyrics. I'm talking about the sounds. The sounds themselves actually impact you. And really the ultimate question is, does, uh, do sounds communicate? And do they change us? Do styles of music have meaning? That, that's a whole other discussion that we probably should have. And the answer is yes, they do. You take away, you strip away any words, any lyrics, and music is a beautiful art form that has great meaning. And it's important that we distinguish what does it mean without the lyrics. What is the sound saying? And how is the sound used to, to, uh, to change my life and to move me and shape my thinking? So music impacts people. We see this in the Bible. Music impacted people in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Now therefore write you this song. I love this verse. Write this song for you and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Isn't it amazing how we remember a song? And if I started singing, singing some commercial jingles from back in the 90s, some of you would be like, oh yeah, I remember that one. You could probably uh, maybe sing it along with me. If, you, if I sang a song that you haven't sung from, uh, from even early years of your Sunday school when you were four or five years old, maybe you haven't even sung it one other time, but you sang it several times when you were a kid. Guess what? You probably could still sing it because we remember songs. And what's great about this passage is it says that one of the best ways to teach our the next generation, and he was telling them this, to pass on the truth, one of the best ways is to take the truth and put it in a musical setting. And that setting, that musical setting will be a reminder. You know what? I do hope that if there's any children of, of parents here at Greendale that are away from God 
And all of a sudden they turn on the radio or maybe they happen to flip through a Christian television station and they hear a song like It Is Well With My Soul or How Great Thou Art or Amazing Grace that down in their heart they're thinking, you know what, I remember singing those songs when I was a kid and maybe it would be a testimony and a witness to even draw them back to the Lord. What a blessing that would be because there's great power in our music. Joshua 6 verse 20 tells us that they actually used music to take down the walls of Jericho. Music was involved in that incredible miracle. And so we could go on and on. Music impacted people in the Bible. In 1 Samuel 16 verse 23, one of the classic examples of this is when uh, David plays on his harp and quiets the heart of Saul. It says that it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. The question is, could David have played something in front of Saul that could have made his spirit more distressed? Yes. Of course. The sounds could have made him more angry. The sounds could have made him more troubled. But there's a certain sound, a certain style of music that was played that quieted his heart. This is a simple illustration to say that not all styles are saying the same thing. Okay, the style is pulling on different parts of us, joyful or, or angry or distressed or restful. And those are d uh, words that could describe different sounds that we're hearing in the music that we listen to. And so the music has incredible power. Acts 16, verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and they sang praises unto the Lord. And we know the rest of the story. God was actually utilizing their singing. And as they sang, he did an incredible miracle and released them from prison they were, as they were singing the hymns of the faith. So music is impacting people in the Bible. And secondly, music is impacting people today. Music is impacting people today. And I just want to give you a, a, a few quotes that help you to understand that people recognize that music is very powerful. It's not just the lyrics that are powerful. It's the music that is powerful. This is from a secular magazine called Cheetah Rock Magazine. And here's what he said about the style of rock and roll music. He said, if people knew what today's pop music was saying, not what the words are saying, but what the music itself is saying, they would ban it. Smash all the records and arrest anyone who tried to play it. Here's a guy writing, being honest about rock and roll style of music. And he's saying it's the music itself that needs to be banned. He said, if people really knew what the music is teaching, not the lyrics, but the music, they wouldn't want anybody to listen to it. James Shute, who's also a secular uh, musician, secular uh, professional music critic here in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, said several years ago, let's not quibble. The music's message is clear. And adding the words Jesus Christ to the lyrics does not make one bit of difference. The music will inevitably overwhelm the best intentions of the lyrics. Here's a secular author writing about his own music, He's critiquing music, he knows music, he knows what the music is teaching and saying, and he's, and he's literally saying it doesn't change anything if you add, if you add Jesus to the rock rhythms, right. which is the total opposite of what's happening in, in our Christian culture where they're saying that if you have good lyrics, it doesn't matter what the sounds are. Yeah. I literally heard one person say this. He said that if you add rap, to Amazing Grace, it doesn't change the meaning of Amazing Grace. So this is the, that's the opposite, that kind of philosophy that says the style does not matter, what matters is the lyrics, that is the opposite of what pretty much everyone I have read in the secular world would say about the sounds. They, they realize that, that the sounds are what are, are what are gripping people. The sounds are what are causing the addictions to this style, these, some of these styles of music. I could go on and on about so many different quotes, but in a great book by uh, Robert Bork called Slouching Toward Gomorrah, maybe some of you have seen that book. He was writing uh, this book about the downward spiral of our culture. He said the music, speaking about the communist regime, he said the music that they were listening to was rock and roll which their parents hated. He said it would be difficult to overstate the cultural importance of the music. He said visiting, during, visiting Yugoslavia in that era, Irving Kristol learned that the regime, the communist regime, banned rock 
music because it was subversive of authority. He remarked that all rock and roll music is subversive of authority. Isn't it interesting that the communists can figure it out, but the Christians can't? Yeah, that's right. sad. It's really sad, isn't it? There's a company called Muzak Incorporated. Some of you may have heard of this company. They actually harness the power of music and sell it. And businesses are uh, paying big bucks to get their musical systems that are supposedly saying to you, buy more of their products, okay? So when you're in Walmart, you don't realize this, the music they're playing is intentionally being played to make you buy more stuff off the shelf. They've actually done scientific studies to prove the power of music. And this is what they said. Music Incorporated said, unlike drugs, music affects us psychologically and physiologically without invading, without invading the bloodstream. The subtle influence of music has been harnessed in programs providing controlled stimulus progression for people at work and at play. And, and the world recognizes this and businesses are buying their, their systems and they're playing music that plays on people's emotions and causes certain motivations and pushes them to do certain things. Pretty much everybody in the musical world, other than Christians, are, are, would admit that the styles of music are communicating certain things in different settings. And the only people that have ever argued that all styles should be valid for the lyrics of, of God, the only people who have ever would argue that are Christians. And uh, they're, they're really ignoring all of music history and all of what's going on in the contemporary world of music today. Uh, even Plato said this. He said, it is hostile to reason that even when articulate speech is added, it is utterly subordinate to and determined by the music and the passions that it expresses. Now, before I go on, I want to make sure you understand that your pastor asked me to share messages today on worship and music. OK, so I'm not doing this on my own. OK, your pastor uh, wanted me to share these kinds of things. He's heard me talk about these things before. And uh, I know that there, there's a lot of controversy in areas of Christian music and there's no intention to agitate anybody and there's no intention to cause any division at all. Uh, but we need to be exposed to truth like this so that we can make good decisions in our worship music. And you may not perfectly agree with your pastor or me or maybe many other people, but you have to decide on your own conscience what, what is honorable, what is appropriate, what is acceptable to the Lord. Remember, as we respond to God intellectually, emotionally, and volitionally, we're responding to Him according to spirit and in truth, according to His character, and in our hearts, we need to make sure that we are worshiping Him appropriately. That's, that's why this is so important. I am very passionate about what I'm sharing, and you know, sometimes I get fired up, but I know that good people can agree to disagree on some of the nuances of these subjects. But, but I think that most Christians haven't really thought through this. And most of the time, Christians, are their whole philosophy is, I like that. And that's not good enough. It's not good enough for us to just have, I like that, and I enjoy that. We need to make sure God is pleased. All right, so we're looking at the power of music. I'm, I'm going fast because I don't want to keep you much longer because that food is, was really good and everybody's getting sleepy, okay? I can see it. Don't, don't, I've been around, I know. Number, number four, let's talk about the purpose. The purpose of music. Does God have any specific goals for our, especially our worship music? Absolutely. The Bible tells us that there are at least three particular scriptural reasons why music is important. What is the purpose of music? First of all, obviously to exalt the sovereign. I like to say it this way. It's not about entertainment. It's about exaltation. Amen. So when we come to church, it's not about pleasing me. It's about pleasing God. And we, I do believe if your heart is really in tune with God, you will actually enjoy exaltation, proper exaltation to the Lord. But the point is the focus should not be on us. The focus should be on the Lord because the, the whole goal of music is to, uh, our Christian music is to worship the Lord, is to exalt the sovereign. There's so many verses about this. I can only give you a few. Second Chronicles 20 verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers that they should praise the beauty of what? His holiness. What you're going to see is that there's a lot of connection to the attributes of God. And this is why we need to use styles of music that are appropriate for God's attributes. If he is beautiful, then we don't use the ugly. If he is holy, then we don't use the unholy. If he is majestic, then we don't use the trite and trivial. 
Make sense? So what we're trying to do is represent his excellence and his and, and his attributes in the, in the best way. And one of the and there's no way we can do this perfectly. There is literally no song that is going to perfectly represent the excellence of God. But we should ascribe to that. We should do the best we can uh, to find the kind of music that is properly lifting up the excellence of his character. So we're praising the beauty of his holiness. Notice Psalm 13, verse 6. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Maybe, maybe you, think, you can think of it this way. We, we give him glory in our, in our music for who he is and also for what he has done. And this is why we have songs like spiritual songs and gospel songs that, that talk about our testimony and our salvation. And songs like even we, we sang this morning, I will, I will sing of my Redeemer. And we're praising him for his bountiful work. The greatest work is salvation. And so we praise him with a song and an appropriate song. Psalm 69, verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. It is clear in the scripture that one of the chief ways to give God glory and praise is through our music. Isaiah 12, verse 5. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. And so we could go on and on. There are so many other verses. I'm just giving you a, a few of them. There's a second reason why we have music. Not only do we have music to exalt the Lord, but the Bible teaches that we should have music to edify us as Christians, to edify the saint. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26 says, Every one of you hath a psalm. Let all things be done unto edifying. The word edifying means to build up, to strengthen. And God has given you a body of believers in this local church assembly. And we're to love one another, serve one another, help one another, pray for one another. And one of the ways that we build up one another is we sing. And we all participate in this singing together, congregationally, so that we can be doing this to edify one another to grow closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 18 is probably one of the classic examples of this. It says be, that we are to be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Notice it says speaking to yourselves. This is why congregational music is important. We don't just sing by ourselves in the shower. We sing at church together, okay? And we want God to be glorified. And so we are edifying one another through singing. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And by the way, it doesn't say singing and making rhythm in your heart to the Lord. Melody is central. And melody should be central in all of our compositions. It really should be. I'm not going to have time to give you uh, all the principles of music because we would be here a lot longer. But I think just to give you, uh, give you a taste of that, I think music people understand this. There are three elements to our music. There's melody, there's harmony, and there's rhythm. Okay? Every musical piece will have those elements. You say, well, what if, what if it's just somebody singing the melody? Well, if you, if you have done any study, you understand that even if you're just singing a note, there's overtones of harmony. So there's harmony actually built in to the melody. But often you'll have a, maybe a two or a three or a four part harmony. And definitely when there's a accompaniment, there's additional harmony. And of course, rhythm is not bad. Don't be afraid of the word rhythm. Uh, you can't have any song without rhythm. I mean, uh, rhythm is like the quarter note, the, the half note, the whole note, putting on a staff, linking them together, putting rests in, putting some, uh, uh, some uh, unique holds in there. All of that is the way that the music carries itself. It's, it's the rhythm. So all those parts are very important, but they need to be in proper balance and perspective. And that means as a believer, I, I, I believe the scripture is showing us here that really the, the most central part of our singing should be the melody. And that everything we're doing harmonically and everything that we're doing with the rhythm should be supporting, should be emphasizing the melody. So the melody is like the thesis. The thesis of a piece of literature, everybody knows, is the most important part of the writing. And this is what makes classic literature so powerful is because there's, some, there's a theme that's running through the literature. And what makes junk literature junk is that the, you're like, this just doesn't seem to fit together. All right. In the same way, in the art of music, there has to be a theme, and the theme is going to be the melody. And this is why in classical music, so many uh, classical musicians will run that theme through several different rhythms, but you'll, you'll, hear the, uh, you'll hear the theme coming back throughout the piece. And that's why there's such structure in that kind of, 
uh, those kinds of sounds. And I think it's important that we recognize when we pick our Christian music, we should be looking for music that is intentionally emphasizing the melody. And what is being done in, in pretty much all of the pop culture of our day is they are flip-flopping that. And what are they emphasizing? The rhythms. Now, I know this goes a little deeper, okay, but melody affects your spirit, harmony affects your mind, and rhythm affects your body. And all you got to do is go to a ball game and see a two or three year old doing what is natural when the rock music plays. Yeah. All right, it's not affecting their mind. <laughs> it's definitely affecting their body as they're dancing around and, and nobody had to tell them to do that. All right. And so when you flip flop, now you have music that is predominantly uh, uh, physical and I think all of those are important. We should be responding to God mentally, emotionally, and physically. I've already said that. And I think it's important. It's pretty neat that we see in music, there's the, there's the mental, there's the, there's the emotional, and there's the physical. And, but it needs to be in proper balance. Most of what's happening in the Christian contemporary music industry of our day, there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on rhythm. We're not against drums. We're not against bass guitars. We're not against those kinds of instruments. Instruments are just tools, okay? They're not sinful. But when, when, they're, when they're put together in a composition to overemphasize the rhythms, now you have music that is expressly physical and not primarily spiritual. And I think it's important that we are careful on that. You say, well, how much rhythm is too much rhythm? You know what? You're going to have to be convinced in your own mind. I have come to the realization for me personally that I, I, I believe the world usually uses the style in its appropriate means. And so I've just decided that I'm not going to be involved in any of our pop rock style of music. And so I'm, I'm not looking for any, I don't really want any rock rhythms and overemphasis of rhythm like that in, in my music. And uh, I know some people say, well, there's light rock and there's heavy rock. And I, and I know there's distinctions there. But I think that we just need to draw some lines of what we're going to do and what we're not going to do because we don't want to be totally out of balance with our sounds, the sounds of the music. I hope this is making sense. There should be a distinction in the sounds. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, notice the edification, teach, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And I think it's important that these verses are remembered as we come to worship the Lord, that the primary purpose of our music is to exalt the Lord. The secondary purpose is about others. It's about edifying other people, which means that we lay aside our own personal opinions and we use music that unifies. We don't want to use music that causes contention. There might be somebody in here and maybe you're a little looser on your music than somebody else is a little tighter on their music. And you know what? God wants us to show deference to people and show kindness and and maybe you become convinced that that's okay for you or that's, uh, that's okay for you on one, one side or the other. But when we come to the corporate body of believers, we should do what causes edification. Amen. And we should choose music that doesn't cause any confusion or contention. And uh, that's why a hymn book is so good, right? Because probably uh, the hymn book joins us together in a great, and there's only one other book that joins us together better, right? That's the Bible. But the hymn book joins us together. But it's like, look at all these hymns throughout church history that are defining for us the theologies of our faith and is causing us to, uh, to engage our hearts and minds together as a body of believers. Maybe we're just kind of selfish when we, if we have this idea, well, our music needs to change. Well, who decides where it changes and who decides what style? Maybe our focus is, is kind of internal and, and self-focused instead of what's for the good of the church. The good of the church is the most unifying music that we can use will help us. And I do believe that that is the hymn. That, that would be the hymns that have stood the test of time and, and have passed down to us and that, that help us to really focus our attention in a proper way on who God is and, and helps us to edify one another. All right, so we exalt the Savior, we edify the saint. And number three purpose, and this is the last one, and I did this on purpose, this is in order of importance that we should use music to evangelize. I already re I read for you Psalm 40, verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth and even praise unto our God. Notice this, many shall see it. 
I love what my friend Tim Fisher says. He says, Christian music is that music in which the text, the performer, the performance style and the performance practices, the text, the music, the performance and the performance practices are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I like that. Because is there any area of our life that should not be radically changed when Jesus saves us? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. So, what I am saying with evangelizing with music is not let's use our music to attract the unsaved. Frankly, this is the truth, folks. Our music in the church should not be that attractive to the unsaved. Because what they hear here should be so different that they're like, wow, that's unusual. Sad to say that's not happening. There's a lot of unsaved people that walk into churches today and it's the same music they listen to. And and oh, oh, I heard Jesus a couple times there. Or I heard something about God and his love. But the sounds are the exact same sounds. And what I'm saying is that the way we evangelize with our music is the same way of we evangelize in other areas. Should people see a difference in our personal life, in our marriage, in our families, in our children, in, in, our, in the way we handle our finances, the way we entertain? Is there any area that I'm mentioning that shouldn't be radically changed by the power of Jesus Christ? So the way we evangelize, evangelize is by showing a changed life. This is the total opposite of what is happening in what is called Christian contemporary music. It is commonly be called to CCM. As a matter of fact, for years and years, they have been trying to say that the reason why we can do this, in other words, use pop rock music with Christian lyrics, is because we want to win people to Jesus. And what I'm saying is I think that's the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be showing a distinction from the world so that people want Jesus. Amen. All right, so I want to just show you that this is what they're saying. In their own magazine, which I subscribed to for a number of years, they, they went away from an actual magazine to an e-zine, and I still read some of their articles here and there. But in their own magazine, these are direct quotes from their own magazine. They said, we want to market the music if at all possible. We don't want to market Jesus to sell our records. That's a problem. That's right. You know, Jesus really is the center of Christian worship. Amen. He said, we're just trying to be a really good rock band. That's our goal. We are trying to make money. We make no bones about it. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty unbelievable what they say about their own music. Uh, here's the, the editor of the magazine, CCM Magazine. He said, my personal experience in Christian music has not been that it is a ministry. Does that bother you? Does that cause a problem for you? I think if you are a true Christian musician, it's all about ministry. Not money, not performance, not applause. He says, I have never been at a meeting in which ministry has ever come up in my life. This is the guy who is writing in editing the CCM magazine and helping people get into Christian contemporary music industry. He says, I don't, when I look at the Christian music industry, I don't see Jesus much. Can I ask you a question? If the, the writer and the editor and the performer is not seeing Jesus, how in the world is the listener seeing Jesus? I'm not sure we're really lifting up the same Jesus. And so this is the, th these are the purposes of our music in the church. Exalt the Lord, edify the saint, and evangelize by showing a radically changed life. Okay, so we've talked about worship, we've talked about music, and there's a lot more to, that, that could be said. But let's talk about the church. Worship, music, and the church. And this is a wonderful quote by James Montgomery Boyce. He's in heaven now. He said, God is worthy of the best. We must not offer him blemished sacrifices. And part of a minister's responsibility is to point his congregation to the best in every area. Don't satisfy for less than the best. And especially when we're representing God. He said ministers should be lifting their people up to the best music as well as art, literature, and other things. Rather than allowing them to slip downward to increasingly lower levels of the surrounding secular culture. That is a description of what we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years in the Christian church. Is that it, it, it just keeps getting worse and worse. So much so that now we're defending Christian rap. I, I even see people defending Christian gangster rap. Which I don't know what's the difference between gangster rap and rap. But 
where we're defending all styles and genres of secular music, so much so that you can find charts on the internet that show you the secular groups and the Christian groups that mimic with Christian lyrics. It's, 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 a, it's a tragedy. But we should be, as Christians, and, and especially Christian ministers in local churches, we should be seeking the best, not downward spiraling, but raising people's expectations, raising uh, them to the glory of God and the beauty of God. And he said this also, and this, I believe this is in the same book. He said, today's songs are reflecting our shallow or non-existent theology and do almost nothing to elevate one's thoughts about God. Remember we talked about that. That's probably the main problem. It's not we need better music and better programs and better plans, but we just need to go deeper with God. And, and the songs that we're using are showing that we don't have much theology. Sometimes it's a non-existent theology. We need to elevate people's thoughts about God. And so that's what your church is attempting to do. That's what I'm attempting to do is I'm training guys. And I'm telling you, it's a battle zone. It's tough. I will tell you right now that probably a huge percentage of our students that come to Maranatha Baptist University are probably fully engaged in listening to all forms, many forms of Christian contemporary music, a high percentage of them. And many of them have never even been taught any of these principles. And uh, they're, they're not listening to the kind of music that really lifts their spirit to the excellence of God, but rather brings them down to the world's perspective. And so it's a battleground, but we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. So I want to say in closing today that we just need to evaluate our music. And I, I referred to this quote earlier that we need music that is, that is conforming to the image of Jesus Christ in these four areas. The text, the, the, the music, the text, the performer, and the performance style. And I think that we need to evaluate that in all areas of our church music. I will say this. Number one on that list is the most important. I think you can have really solid lyrics, but if you have music that says the opposite, then you're destroying the lyrics. So I think the sounds, we got we to gotta come to grips with this, that sounds and styles have meaning, and we need to figure out what they're, what. What, what meaning there is. And there, there's a lot of nuances to that. You can have a joyful song, but there's different types of joy. I don't want the same joyful song I have at a ball game for my joy for God. I don't want the same joy I have for holding a child or, or getting excited about something my kids did that I have for God. So there's, there's a lot of nuances there. And, and, and musicians understand that they can manipulate people's feelings and emotions in certain ways. We need to evaluate the sounds, the music itself. What is the music teaching? What is the music saying? And then once you are convinced that the sounds are, are really quality and can say something, then you want to get appropriate lyrics for those sounds. And what's really awesome is when, it's a, when there's this perfect unity of what the lyrics are saying with what the sounds are saying. That's a wonderful thing. And that's what we as musicians that are, uh, I can just say for me personally, what I'm trying to present, whether it's on a, a musical recording or whether it's in a, a presentation like even the special music in the church, that we would have music that in the sound and the lyrics are appropriate for one another and that they're unifying together. And it's a powerful medium. It's a powerful thing. And then I think we should evaluate the performer because uh, especially in, when it comes to Christian ministry, they are ministers of the gospel. They should have a good testimony. They should, they should be seeking to please the Lord. And then, of course, the performance style. And this is obvious today in the Christian world. Some, sometimes it's just unbelievable what people are calling Christian. You know, the, the same stage, the same lights, the same dancing, the same um, perform, the, the look of the performers is unbelievable. And I've done so much study and reading. And, and I, you know, sometimes it just gets kind of disgusting what some people are claiming is Christian. It's not really Christian in the way they perform. And it needs to be all about God, not about the performance. So we're evaluating our music in these, in these four areas. Now, I'm going to have to stop here, but I want to tell you that if this is kind of uh, drawing you into some 
uh, maybe a greater learning experience, if you're wanting to get more information about this, there's a lot of opportunities available for you, not only through written materials, but a couple of years ago, uh, Mike and I had this idea, and primarily Mike has been spearheading this, this idea and the organization of this idea of a worship conference. And we actually had our first worship conference two years ago. We had to cancel it last year because of COVID. Hosted by uh, Colonial Hills Baptist Church, sponsored and pushed by South and Christian Ministries. And we're having our second music conference, worship conference, January 3rd, 4th, and 5th of this next year. And there's so many workshops and so many lessons and general sessions. And all of the sessions were recorded from the first worship conference. <clears throat> and they can, be heard, they can be heard and streamed on theworshipconference.org. Did I say that right, Mike? Theworshipconference.org. And if you want to go deeper with this, I'm telling you, there's a lot of really good information out there. You could even plan to maybe come and, and, and bring your, your older kids or, you know, pastor can bring some of the musicians from the church, whatever God leads you to do. And it, that conference will be in January of this next year, January 2022, January 3rd, 4th and 5th at Colonial Hills Baptist Church. And I believe it is time for us to continue to propagate a conservative traditional view of Christian music. Amen. And we need to do it carefully. We need to do it kindly. But we need to be bold and courageous and to say the truth as it is. Amen. We also told you already we have our CDs available. There are lots of wonderful CDs that we're not on, but because we're on these, they're the ones we have, okay? So you come there, and if you, we can help you get some good music, and I will tell you that we have sought, we're not perfect at this, but we have sought to practice what you're hearing, uh, what you're hearing from the music in the church here the, this morning, and what you've heard from me at, in this philosophy. We are trying to uh, lift up the most excellent kinds of, and qualities of music uh, so that you can honor the Lord and worship the Lord, and I believe they'll be a blessing to you. And uh, this is what we're attempting to do at the university as well. And hope you'll pray for us. Uh, they used to say it's a worship war. The worship war is still going. It's still going. Still a really big issue to keep talking about. And I hope that whatever I've shared here today will just encourage you as a person. To remember those three levels, personally, family and church. It is important that we are honoring God appropriately with our music. And I hope that we would have a new song. A new song of praise to the Lord. You guys did great. I know, I know you have full stomachs, and I know it probably went a little longer than you were expecting. I saw a few nodding heads, but most of you did great. Let's pray, and we'll conclude today. God, thank you so much for the, just the blessing and the good gift of music. What a blessing it is. Thank you for the privilege of being involved in it, uh, in the church, and in our worship to you. I pray that we would be careful, that we would... fast love of the Lord. Did you hear all the metaphors from creation? And uh, that, that is a quality written song because it draws on our hearts and it makes our minds engage. If we sing that the, his love, it, we see his love like a rainbow or like the, the mist across the water or like the...